with guilt and shame, unlike, I don't know, um, unlike grief, you can cry, anger, you can yell, but shame and guilt is all internal. It just eats you in the inside. That's very different emotion. Welcome to the Sharp End Podcast YouTube channel. I'm Ashley, the creator and hostess of the show. This podcast aims at minimizing future outdoor accidents by way of storytelling. Real people sharing real stories. Okay, everybody. Uh, I have another wonderful guest here on the show tonight. Um, it's five o'clock Alaska time and nine o'clock her time. So I'm grateful that she was able to work me in uh, on that East Coast time. Um, welcome to the show. Will you please go ahead and introduce yourself to the audience? Hi, um, my name is Miriam Bouchard and I'm 60 years old. I'm a weekend warrior. I identify as a hiker, more than a climber now, but at the time um, of what we're bringing up tonight is I was definitely a climber first and foremost. Um, I hail from French Quebec, uh, born and raised in Montreal, moved to New York City, and then ended up in the Gunks um, in New Paltz, home of the Shawangunk Ridge with, with fabulous, fabulous climbing. Um, so I did not start climbing immediately here. Um, I must have lived here like four or five years before I started climbing. I got divorced. I had every other weekend off from the kids. And then it was like, people were saying, you should start climbing. I'm like, no, you're crazy. I'm afraid of height. <laughs> uh, and, but it was really nice to find a tribe that was so extraordinary. So i um, very pleased with that. And, and uh, what kind of climbing is the gunks? What type of rock is it? So it's quartz conglomerate, um, and where the cracks are not vertical, like in granite, um, it, they're they're horizontal. Um, completely different style of climbing. There are some, you know, vertical cracks, but it's mainly horizontal. And it's um, amazing climbing because you can have a five three next to a five ten, and they're both amazing, and they bo they'll both have a roof. Um, they both are exposed, but one is five three, and the other one is five ten. You know, uh, right next to each other. So it's 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 pretty amazing. I've never climbed to the gunks. Hopefully, I can make it over there one day. Uh, hit me up when you come. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. And so, what are we what are we talking about today? What happened? So. I was listening to your podcast, by the way, and I want to thank you for that. Um, a friend um, in introduced me to The Sharp End, and I was listening to your stories, uh, not in any particular order, and then I decided to start them in order. Um, and in your early ep episodes, there's a um, gentleman whose friend, um, he was belaying, um, he you know, the, in, in climbing parlance, um, the rope sl slid through the belay device and he fell uh, because the rope was too short for the for the for lowering. Um, and it brought back a, a lot of memories because that's what happened to us at City of Rocks in August of 2010. At, City of Rocks. Yeah, City of Rocks, Idaho. Idaho. That's that's my favorite cragging area. Yeah, we're having a lot of fun and uh, spent a few days there to climb. Then we went on a backpacking trip. We we're not planning on going back, but on our last day of, your, of our backpacking trip, um, it was snowing and sleeting and was like, well, let's get out of here. So we went back to City of Rocks for one last day of climbing. And um, we woke up early, very excited by beautiful cobalt blue days. Um, had scouted the climb the day before and proceeded, you know, at the time I had been climbing 14 years and Luke had been climbing about, you know, 25, 30 years. Um, so he had a lot more, actually, not at the time yet, he has, yeah, 40 years by then. So he had a lot more uh, of climbing experience than me and was a better climber. So he always was the rope gun. So he set up the rope. Um, it was a bolted anchor at the top. 
and then he said, are you ready to lower? I'm like, yeah. Um, well, so is this a one pitch climb or yeah. multi pitch climb? What one single pitch climb? It's a, it's called uh, twist and shout. Do you remember what it was rated? Uh, five, eight. It was a five, five eight, eight twist and shout. Yeah. And, um, it was, and yeah, no, twist and crawl, sorry, twist and crawl, twist and crawl. Um, either way, he set up the rope up and um, put it through the anchor, and then, then he said, okay, I'm ready to lower. I'm like, okay, I'm lowering. And then about uh, 20 feet from the ground, um, the rope was too short, and it slid through my belay device without me noticing until it was too late and for those who don't understand what it's like to be lowered when you're rock climbing it's basically the position is like you have both feet on the rock and you're like in the lazy boy right you're completely extended with your body almost perpendicular to the rock so there's a lot of um weight upper body weight hanging in the air so as soon as the tension got released from the rope um he fell backwards and hit his head and um became unconscious and then um he basically um stumbled down the rock uh, because it was somewhat low angle at that point um and hit his head repetitively in his neck and his back and then ended next to me so I had at the time wilderness first aid, which is, I believe, the bare minimum any outdoors person should have. I just completed wilderness first responder in December. Um, it's now in a hybrid form, which is great. You can do the 30 hours on your own, and then you go 30 hours in person, much more manageable. Um, and But either way, whether I had a woofer or a woofer, it was way above um, my skill set because he was unconscious and uh, he was bleeding from his mouth, his ears, his nose, and he had multiple lacerations of the scalp. So, and he was unconscious. So, um, at the time, I don't know how it is now, but at the time there was no cell service. So, I had to leave him and get for help. We were not in a remote, remote area that I would have needed to use the spot. And we're, the car was literally, you know, a couple hundred yards away. So there was really no point of uh, activating the, the spot. But, um, and I didn't even think it was in the car, left in the car. So we went, I, I left him there and I repositioned his, uh, his limbs because they were in a weird position, left them. Uh, not knowing if I'll come when I come back, if he'd be dead or alive, because I didn't know the extent of his injuries. And it must have been terrifying to to have that thought. Like if I come back, he might not be alive. It was the greatest terror of my life, for sure. When I got in the car, um, I was yelling so hard, like. This is not how you're going to die. And don't leave me like this. This is not, you know, this is not how it's supposed to be. And I was banging my wrist, my, 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 my fist on the, the, on the dashboard to the point where the next day my, my uh, wrist was swollen. So it was kind of this big uh, adrenaline uh, discharge when I got in the car and not knowing where, if I had to go all the way to the en entrance to get self service or to talk to the Rangers, um, that was like 15 minute drive. So I'm thinking half an hour, you know, it's like, it's really adding up. But I got to the first bathroom and there was a ranger truck there. So I was able to alert the ranger that he had a head injury and we needed a vac. He was unconscious um, and turn around immediately. So I really was gone maybe like 10 minutes, if that. And when I came back, he was not really... Um, he was moaning. Uh, he was not unconscious, but I mean, he was still unconscious, but he was at least moaning and, and um, not really responsive, but he was at least, you know, alive. Um, the Rangers arrived really, really quickly. And 
the the ambulance came. You know, it's a multi-step operation, right? So the uh, they came and he became agitated, like a lot of head injury, I guess, happens. So, combative yeah, is combative. what happens. Combative, yes. That's exactly it. He became combative. So there were two people holding him down because he wanted to, he was just trashing around and we didn't know what type of injuries he had. So we were just like, wanted to stay, keep him immobilized. But very shortly thereafter, like I lost track of time, to be honest, but very shortly thereafter, um, the ambulance came. And they brought a litter. They brought him to the ambulance. The ambulance brought him to a field where there was um, already a, 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 a helicopter waiting. So it was pretty amazing. Like within, I would say, an hour, he was in a chopper on his way to Ogden. And um, he was, they, they sedated him um, as soon as, he got into the ambulance and they intubated him. Um, so when he left in the chopper, my last scene of him was him being intubated and not knowing what state I would find him when I would see him a few hours later. I was three hours away by, by, by car away. You know, we were three hours away from Ogden. So Ogden, Utah. Yes. Ogden, Utah, where he was transported. So, um, I was obviously extremely shaken and, you know, they were checking on me to see, to make sure that I could drive. Uh, the Rangers proceeded to clean the route, which, you know, means they all got the gear back, our rope, um, and all the camping stuff. This other um, Ranger came and helped me put all the camping stuff in the car and then made sure I was okay. Uh, to drive and then gave me directions. Um, that was before smartphones. I only had a, a dumb flip phone. Um, so they were nice enough to print me directions and say, just follow these. Um, and then I left and um, I, we were not married. So the hospital would not would not talk to me unless I had a healthcare you, proxy. You, you and Luke, you and Luke weren't yeah. married. And they would okay. not share any information about his medical conditions until they had on hand the healthcare proxy. So I had to call a friend of ours, tell him where the key was hidden and tell him which file it was in and the, which cabinet in the house and fax it back to the hospital. So I think that took a couple hours. So meanwhile, I'm driving, I don't know what's going on. Um, and then I finally get a call that says he's in ICU. We're doing scans and x-rays, um, and we're stapling his scalp. Um, it was not a, a, a fracture, thank God. Um, it was just lacerations. They put 40 staples, like, like 10 inches total of different la lacerations in his scalp. So he hit his head uh, quite a number of times uh, really hard. So I finally... Was he wearing a helmet? Was not wearing a helmet, and I always wear a helmet because I, since the day I started climbing, I felt like I only have one brain. <laughs> I have two of many things, but I only have one brain. And at the time, my kids were little, and I felt a responsibility to stay healthy. So, and I never, uh, I made a rule like if you climb, you put a helmet. Like the same way, like if you bike, you wear a helmet. Looks like it's not. Oh, it's a nice, you know, that's a nice little climb that. Doesn't seem too bad. I'm not going to wear a helmet. Well, no, you never know when shit can happen. So I always, always wear a helmet. Um, but he had been climbing for a long time, started in his teens. I started in my late, you know, mid thirties. He started in his early teens and his 40 years of, uh, climbing, you know, basically, um, experience or advantage over me meant that he had his he was set in his ways and not wearing a helmet was definitely one of his ways so he was not wearing a helmet um when i got to the hospital um first off it, it was an amazing hospital um it's called the mckay d hospital in ogden and they had i'm gonna call him a social worker i don't know if he, what his what his title was i don't remember but he came to me and took two hours, just one-on-one -on -one with me sitting on a park bench in, the, in their garden to chat about 
Um, did I have a, you know, he knew I had basically, you know, seen a traumatic event and was part of that event. And um, he was asking about my support system. And he was asking, do, did you eat today? And do you know where you're sleeping tonight? And he was asking all these really basic questions. But that made the world to me because uh, he really helped me be ground, get grounded. He, you know, when I said oh, I didn't eat today, I was like, okay, let's you get, let's get you something to eat, and then I ate, and then you know, basic things that made me feel more grounded. At one point, I was able to kind of like take it all, take it all in. Um, so that was pretty amazing. I never experienced anything like that um, in a hospital. And meanwhile, they got all these diagnoses. Um, by the time I got there, they knew that um, he had um, torn an MCL, he had fractured his nose, he had fractured his acromion process, he had... What's that? That's the uh, part of your scapula that sticks out in your back. So that little line that you can oh, okay. feel, that's that's what that is. Um, and he had, um, yeah, broken a rib and, and he had completely sheared off the spinous process. That's the little, um, you know, of, of a, of a vertebrae. It's like, a, the vertebrae is like a little circle with that little, um, piece of bone that sticks out, right. That we can feel with our hands if you go around, along your spine. That's what these are. It's the spinous processes that are sticking out. Well, he had completely sheared off the sixth cervical vertebrae spinous process, and um, he was just lucky to be walking, um, to be able to move his limbs. So he had a bunch of, and of course, traumatic brain injury because of the concussion that was pretty severe. So he had um, a lot of different injuries that were um, basically they all said all you need is rest. There were not there was nothing. There was no surgery to be had. There was no um, even for his MCL. They just said go home and start PT and you'll get better. Meanwhile, um, you know there's a, there, I want to I want to stop here like this first part of the story because there were a lot of lessons learned with this part. And um, what I'd like to focus on is that this was 100% preventable. And it was a stupid accident. And my mentor, when I was making calls and writing emails, my mentor, um, climbing mentor, called me from where he was. He was in Baghdad. It was like 3 a.m. or something where he was. I'm like, what are you doing? He says, like at 3 a.m. He says, but I, I got up to pee and I saw your email and I had to call. I'm like, okay. And he goes, Miriam, you know, it was a stupid accident. And accidents happen. That's why they're called accidents. And you really didn't want me to uh, beat myself up, which I did not su succeed in not doing. But uh, definitely it was nice to know that he understood that stuff happens. But um Preventable in many ways. You can mark the middle of your rope, which is something when I was lowering, I was like, is this rope marked? Like I was wondering, and I didn't ask him. I'm like, hey, look, is this rope, is this rope marked? Because it did cross my mind. I was like, ah, I don't know if it's, did I miss the mark? If it's in there, I didn't ask. Um, wear a helmet. Um, of course, tie a knot. Always close the system because... Um, Things like this happen, and there were tie knot yes, at the, end of the rope. at the end of the rope. Even when you think it reaches, or you know it reaches, why? Because you want it to be done all the time, so the day that you need it, you didn't have to think about it. It's there. And when you tie a knot at the end of the rope, it means that it can't slip through your belay device. Exactly, and you can tie yourself in, which is always what I do. Um, but with Luke, he didn't like me tying in when he would tie in because, um, if there were any kinks in the rope, he felt it made it worse. So he, he never wanted me to be tied in like that. Uh, only like, you know, when it was my time to get up or whatever. Um, talk to locals, like ask locals, check 
bulletin boards in the location you're climbing to see if there are any, you know, warnings, which there were, about uh, having a 70 meter rope instead of a 60 meter rope. Many routes at City of Rocks are meant for 70 meter ropes. So, and they said on that bulletin, like, put a knot at the end of your rope. So little reminders like this. Um, and of course, as a belayer, <laughs> keep an eye on the rope. Now I have to tell you when I belay, the rope is in front of me. It's like, I have to be blind not to see it. So um, you make this kind of mistake only once and I kid you not, it stays with you forever. Um, so yeah, keep an eye on your rope. Um, do simple things like have a healthcare proxy. I mean, if I would have not had one, that would have not known until he got the, released from the hospital what was wrong with him until he could have explained it to me, which he couldn't. So it's little things, but um, that made life a little easier. Um, also, may sound trivial, but get travel insurance. I had to change the flight like three times because I was being told... I think he's going to be fine tomorrow, which he wasn't. And then maybe the next day, which he wasn't. So I'm, you know, pushing our return multiple times, um, which would have been a lot easier if I had, if we had insurance. And we did have a membership with the American Alpine Club, but to be honest, it was the last thing on my mind. I just wanted the Rangers to start the motion of getting the help we needed. And it was not in my phone. I don't even know where that information was. So unless you have it on speed dial in your phone. So if you're a member of the AAC and you have that insurance, just now it's in my phone, but at the time it wasn't. And just put it in your phone and be ready to call if you need it. Yeah, um, and call them too and talk to the American Alpine Club about how to engage that service, what to do, exactly. what and if you engage it. You know, I... I have, uh, I have, I am a member of their club too. And I also like, I don't really know the steps super well. So I think that could be a really great potential future bonus episode. Just so we can teach everybody what to do. That's a great idea. That really is a great idea. Um, that or your spot or whatever, just, just know, you know? Yeah. Um, so I find, you know, um, that, there are three parts to this story. And so this was the first part, the accident, before we got back home. Um, and then once we got back home, it was a whole different story because, um, and a whole different reality. And I'm, 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 I'm pointing the return and, and the recovery because it's often missed. I find in, in a lot of the stories that you've had on your podcast, which I've listened to a lot, um, People talk about this, you know, lessons learned about the accident, but they don't talk about what happens after. And what happens after is sometimes, if not as traumatic, dramatic, it's definitely as traumatic sometimes because your whole life is turned upside down. Um, and when we came back, um, well, I was expected at work. Uh, at the time, I was a business advisor and um, also ran a small business with a friend and also had another uh, part-time job on weekends. I'll talk about that later, but I was super busy with my life. Um, but I had to put everything on hold pretty much and take care of him because he couldn't drive. Um, he, well, he just, you know, lost a lot of his, uh, cognitive skills in the beginning. It was the first week I'd say he was pretty much in the fog. Um, and he was also wearing, after we saw a neck specialist, he was wearing this rigid race that he was told he had to wear for 10 weeks, not drive, not do anything, basically, just like let your the your neck heal from this trauma and let um, the body take over that extra piece of, of, of bone that was just sticking out loose to be absorbed with you know, scar tissue or whatever um, that the body creates to keep these in, in place. Were you and Luke, um, and you don't have to answer this if you don't feel comfortable, were, were you and Luke dating or were you just living together? We were living together. Yeah. Okay. We've been living together for, um, we had, a, we bought a house 
eight years prior and had been living together a few years prior to that. So we had been together. So you're like domestic partners. Yes. We had been together okay. for 14 years and we were our climbing buddies and outdoors buddies. Right. And every time, you know, I had free time, we'd spend, you know, that's what we do, outdoor stuff. Backpacking and winter camping and, you know. So you weren't just climbing buddies. You were in a, like an intimate relationship together. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank okay. you. Yes. So we come back and thank God I had this really great job where September 1st, I would get a bucket of sick days and personal days. And I was able to start using them immediately to take a day or two off a week and take him to his appointments and PT and, and, and doctors and neurologists and scans and x-rays and uh, orthopedists and second opinions. And it was just like this nonstop barrage of appointments. And for me, um, I was carrying the guilt and the shame of the accident. You know, he was in pretty bad shape, but I was instrumental in making this condition that was in front of me every day. And, and I could see his struggles and I could see um, his pain and it, it just made it just it was just awful. Um, so I was struggling with that. He was struggling with his physical and, um, brain injury. And he was also, um, told you don't, you can't go to work because his job required him to be a hundred percent and he was definitely not. So what happens in the aftermath is that your life is upside down. It's turned upside down. You have no income. You had no income. Um, bills are coming in. The helicopter ride was 28,000. The, um, medical bills, um, because he was out of state, were all out of network. So we're getting all these invoices from left and right and every specialist you can think of from Ogden. And, um, I'm pretty organized. So I started this spreadsheet because I, I thought, oh, I'm going to keep up with this, right? No, like two weeks in, I'm like, I'm, I was lost. I was like, I, I need a spreadsheet. This is like getting out of control because I would get these invoices. I would send them to his insurance company and then, you know, an insurance company would process and send a check sometimes, not all of it. And it was just like, and then I had to go pay them. It had to be funneled through his basically personal accounts. It was just a lot of management, literally had a whole, by the end of this was done, I had like a page of like a hundred lines, I'm not kidding, of a spreadsheet with, you know, receipts and such. So if you don't have an advocate, that's for you. I mean, I was a, a, in that position by default being his partner, but if you don't have a partner, if you don't have an advocate, I don't know how people do it. I don't, he would have never been able to do it on his own with his brain, traumatic brain injury, having to manage this. So in the aftermath, you know, one of the thing that um, really is preoccupying is, is the fact that you have to continue life and life is stopped. Um, a lot of people, you know, it can lead, it can lead to bankruptcy. I mean, a lot of people just can't survive this. We were very, very lucky to have had the climbing, the local climbing community, NFR, um, rally and do a fundraiser because he would still be paying his bills now. What's NFR? And, and AFAR, like local. Oh, community okay. And the climbing community and AFAR. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. you're, yeah, you're, you're, you're climbing community, your friends. Yes, exactly. Um, and he was expected, he was expected to return to his job when he was not ready. So he almost lost his job. So I'm there talking to the union and having to get letters from all his doctors. And it was just, that was just the first three months after the accident. It was, to me, it's just a whirl. It's just things like just survival. You just look at your feet and you go from A to B, C to D, and you just like go through emotions. And the next day you repeat. And the one thing that really helped was, um, some people say, what do you need? And, you know, and, and this is for your listeners, anyone, you know, that has experienced trauma and that can be ac car accident. It doesn't have to be climbing. Accident. It can be anything. It could be, you know, difficult delivery or just a delivery, uh, divorce, um, bad news of a diagnosis, um, 
you know, name it, a death in the family of a loved one, whatever. You can't ask them what they need because they don't know what they need. They're in survival mode. The one friend that reached out to us, he said, who's mowing your lawn? I'm like, oh, I said, I don't know. It was, it was Luke and he's not, you know, he's not going to be able to do it. So I'm like, um, wow, I don't know. And he goes, well, I'll be there every week. Don't have to think about it. So it's just the fact that he was able to, you know, step up and offer help. And in a thing that was very simple, but if you multiply that by four or five other things, it, it just simplifies the person's life so much. So, you, you know, think about the time you have available. It could be like, hey, I'll show up once a month and I'm going to change all the sheets of the beds and do the bathrooms. And then that person knows once a month that those tasks are done and they don't have to think about it. I mean, we all have this mundane stuff to do, you know, or it all adds up. It all adds, it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming and all adds up. You know, I'll take the dog out, tire him out. I'll take him, the dog to the vet. I'll change the oil, whatever. Um, but it makes a big difference. So, but what happened during that period is that um, he was bored. I mean, he had, he had some hobbies that kept him busy, but he was definitely bored uh, for being an active guy. And, um, and I'd come back from work some, and he started drinking alcohol more than he normally did. And I'd come back from work and he'd be opening his second bottle, which totally traumatized me because I was reading about how to heal traumatic brain injury and what are the things to do and not to do. And alcohol is on the do not do list. And um, so I would send him like white papers or medical journal articles and research that had been done. Um, and it was not sinking in. So that became very stressful by itself. Um, when he was able to go back to work, it did help, but he did remain um, a pretty active drinker, which was very, very difficult. And the other thing that happens in the aftermath is um, because of all that stuff, um, which is my guilt and my shame and my own, you know, dealing with this. You're blaming yourself. Yeah, you just blame I'm definitely yourself. blaming myself. He, he, Luke never blamed me. He was, uh, he never felt it was, hundred percent to be blamed. Um, he blamed it on the bolts, not having a, um, standard. It's like people can put bolts at 30 meters or 70 meters or 60 meters. And you never know, you know, where they are unless, um, yeah, you never know where they are because there are no standards. Um, I was more, um, and I'm going to segue into, you know, this, what I call the third part. Um, but, but first I want to finish uh, the second part, which is the aftermath. Um, I was suffering when he finally got better that he could go to work and not wear his neck. Uh, about how many months, how many months in was that into his so recovery? Accident, did, did it? Yeah. So the accident happened in end of August and he went back four months later. He went back to work four months later. In December yeah. of 2020, of 2010. Yeah, 2010, right. So it was a pretty long time. Um, so he was somewhat resuming like his life. Um, <clears throat> I personally was a wreck. I uh, was seeing the accident in odd places. I'm on a red light while I'm driving, and there I see the accident. I'm in the shower, and I see the accident. I'm like you see him I see falling, him falling next and to hitting you. His, yeah. yeah, and I could not watch any anything that had remotely an, an ounce of violence. I mean, I, it was my big rom con period because anytime there was an ounce of violence or any blood or any, I just could not handle it. I mean, I literally would go into severe anxiety. Um, like what, what would happen in your body when that would, when that would, it happen? was just this awful feeling. I mean, this, the worst feeling it was the worst year of my life. And it was the worst feeling ever to have been instrumental in this much suffering for somebody you love. You know, it's really, um, I don't know how you get over that. So 
I was not unfamiliar to trauma. I'm a survivor of childhood sexual abuse, and I had to deal with that healing in my early 20s and had tried all kinds of modalities and therapies. And what had worked for me was neuro-linguistic programming, NLP, which is like um, it's a modality that basically helps you rewire your memories, rewire your brain and, and, and laying over bad me- memory, a good memory. That's the simplest I can explain this. And I had been trained as also in that modality as a in my mid uh, 20s when I was studying body mind therapy and was familiar with that. So I sought after I waited six months um, when I was having all these flashbacks and decided that they're not going away. Six months is the cutoff for PTSD when you have consistent symptoms. I was like, all right, I'm going to get help. And I went to see this uh, NLP therapist and we did a few sessions and that really helped me. It really helps take the intensity of the emotion off. So it's not like I was not sad or that I was not feeling guilt or shame. It was just at a bearable um, space as opposed to unbearable. Like, like you, like maybe you weren't getting the anxiety attacks or anxiety, I was, fe- like feelings that were deep inside yeah, and, you. You know, with guilt and shame, unlike, I don't know, um, unlike grief, you can cry, anger, you can yell, but shame and guilt is all internal. It just eats you in the inside. That's very different emotion. Um, so it brought that intensity down a notch, which was very, very helpful. And, um, and then I, at one point I wrote a story about it just to get it out of my system and for others to learn from that simple avoidable mistake. And um, also realized that we were definitely, you know, at our, at our different paces, but Luke and I were definitely going through the five stages of mourning of Kubler-Ross, which are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And the way we dealt with that was initially it was just like, denial, like this should not have happened to us sort of thing. Like this is not something that, um, that's an avoidable thing. It should have not, just not happened to us. And it's, and then there was, um, anger, like, why did this happen to us? And then it was bargaining, like, well, what if we had standards for the bolts and we had, I don't know, a little ring attached to the bolt saying how, how many meters it is to the ground. So you knew when you got there that, you know, whether or not your rope would reach. And there was all this like bargaining, like, what if, what if, what if? And then um, I fell into a dark place. I was, I got really depressed. It was like, I could not see my life different than just feeling like this, which was terrible. And, um, And I was going to therapy and really trying to fix that. And then one day I realized, like, I'm not going to fix that. It's like, this is part of my story now. Um, You know, you broke your, you break your arm, you have a surgery, you have a scar, right? So, and there's always that little, it might be this little pain in your arm or in your elbow all the time um, because of that injury. And that's just how it is, right? You hurt yourself, you have that um, pain and it comes and goes, but you don't try to fix it. You just know it's there. And when I finally came to that stage of acceptance, like this is part of my history. Now that was before the accident. There's now after the accident. And when I think about that moment, I'll always feel terrible. I'll always feel sad and that's okay. That's just how it is. Um, ran into a community member, um, By then it was July, I think. So about a year later, I was running and ran into this community member who had lost his wife of um, cancer the year before. And I had not seen him because I was, you know, absorbed by all this. And when I saw him on the trail, I said, oh, Evan, I owe you a hug. I owe you a hug for everything you've gone through. And um, and he turned to me and says, you know, he says, yeah, I'm still working on things, but how are you? I'm like, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. He says, no, no, he looked at me like, you know, like deep, deep, deep in my eyes and he says, how are you? I said, I feel like shit <laughs> all the time pretty much. But, you know, 
I'm okay with it. I came to point to the point where I'm like, it's gonna, that's just part of my history. And I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to be able to fix that. It's just how it is. And he was like, yeah, I had that morning and that weight of losing her. I came to that same conclusion too. Sometimes it's just part of you. You're just going to always feel, you know, a certain way when you remember things. So, you know, you can try to fix it. Doesn't make it any no, easier. No, it does it? not. It does not make it any easier. But there is a weight that lifts when we decide to just accept exactly. it. So, um, yeah, it's just it's you. You don't necessarily recover. And I know that you had some pretty traumatized folks interviewed on your podcast. That you know we could tell they were so, you know, pretty much still in shock and might always be in shock when they go back to that moment in time where everything changed. And sometimes, you know, that's just how life is. Um, so, so in the second part of the aftermath, um, our lessons learned were, you know, that there are incredible costs to an accident. I mean, it's financial, it's emotional, it's relational, it's professional. Um, and for us, it was definitely relational. Um, now I'm going to move to the what I call the third part of this um, interview, which is the power dynamic of the relationship and how it influenced, um, I think, um, the accident. Um, so when I, when we met, I had just been climbing for about a year. He had been climbing already for 25 years or more, uh, a little more than 25 years. So aside from the fact that he had way more experience than me, he was also a much, much better climber than me. I mean, I pretty much at the time was climbing maybe 5'8", and I moved to maybe climbing 5'9s pretty quickly, but that's where I plateaued. And he was a 5'12 climber, and he was putting routes up, trad routes, hard trad routes, and scary hard trad routes. And... How old How old were you both when all this happened? I was, in 2010, I was 47, and he was 53. So we had this big gap of experience and of um, skill set. And although I grew into a climber, while in the relationship, there was always, he made the decisions. Um, we'd go climbing together. He, you know, he'd take me up something that was at my limit. I'd get tired and then I'd blame him on something that he had interested. And then we'd finish the day on something easier for him and hard for me. And then, you know, we call it a day. So that was, you know, it worked out. Um, but there was always, he made those decisions, right? He was a rope gun. And it was actually pretty lucky at City of Rocks that I actually knew where we were because I would we would go on climbing trips and I would literally turn my brain off in the sense of I would I had, you know, all these jobs, my two kids as a single parent, and I was just like, I'd go on a trip and just like, yeah, you make the decisions, you know, it's like I'm fine with that. So I would I pretty much would give away my decision making. And like I said, it was lucky I knew where it was uh, at the time because oftentimes I did not even know where we were and I didn't care because I was like, oh, I'm on vacation. I don't want to control everything and know everything. But uh, in hindsight, that's not a good attitude. So I was happy that day that I knew where we were um, so I can somehow so I could send help back. Um, but so there was this power dynamic of him knowing more than I do because of his experience, even though and people are going to roll their eyes. But at the time, I was a single pitch instructor, American Mountain Guide Association certified, and I was guiding on weekends. And it was like, it was another thing that was like, you know, hitting my head on the wall, like, how the hell does this happen? You know, I, I know better. But we were not in a client guiding relationship, for sure, because he would have been wearing a helmet. I would have had a knot at the end of the rope. I mean, I would have had all the things done right because that's what you do as a guide. I had really given up my power and I trusted him a hundred percent until that day. And then, um, 
there was also this gender relationship, you know, he, not that he was a macho guy by any stretch of the imagination, but there's also, you know, he was stronger than me and he was, he, you know, he could do different things than me. So definitely uh, gender played in the, in the, in the, and then there was also the relationship. So we were an intimate relationship um, and there are some constructs in relationships where, you know, you agree to certain things, right? So to not rug the boat because it was basically his turf, I would not, you know, I would just, I just gave it up. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be the one that dictates where to go, how to do it and where to do it. I'm just going to follow. But um, after the accident, um, I felt betrayed because I trusted him. I trusted when he said, I'm ready to lower, that it was okay, right? I never doubted that he didn't know, that he couldn't know, or he didn't, you know, did did not do his due diligence for whatever reason, or he thought he did and he hadn't fully. Um, so I felt betrayed in a way that I could not even begin to um, heal. I lost trust in him. I mean, uh, every time we'd go out. Well, how long did it take for you to lose trust? How, how long did it take for you to come to that conclusion? Cause I, I feel like it, that's not what you were thinking at first, right? You were thinking, gosh, it's all my fault. What have I done? Yeah, exactly. So remember this happened in end of August, the whole fall, he couldn't climb. Then the winter came. And then in the spring we went out again and that's when it hit me. I don't trust him anymore. Like I second guessed everything, and then we we're on. You know, we would argue. I'm like, I'm tying in. Don't art. Don't. And he would say, Don't tie in. I'm like, I'm tying in. That's it. I'm just tying in all the time. That's just how it is from now. When you want to climb with me, I'm tying in. And you're wearing a helmet because your head cannot so you know cannot get a pebble on it. But so, you, but you, but you did climb again together, and that that was one of my going to be one of my questions. And it sounds like you did eventually get a break through that that barrier and get back on the, but on the it rock. Was but it wasn't fun anymore. But it wasn't fun and anymore. I, it was not fun anymore. And I looked at my journal, my climbing journal, and in the, we stayed together for another five years. And in those five years, uh, we climbed, we had five climbing days, which, which usually would have been in a month. But this was like over a year's time, we eventually stopped climbing together. You know, it was like that the, for those five days were in the first couple of years and then we just stopped climbing together because it was not fun. And um, this was the last outdoor trip we did together. And then um, there was this big tension about, his, you know, his alcohol consumption, which was very difficult for me. And the relationship did not survive. So it took us five years, but it's that that accident was absolutely instrumental in ending this relationship. So the cost of this lapse of momental lapse of attention had so many consequences that, um, you know, it's easy to be complacent, especially when you're doing something that becomes over time, super familiar and to cut corners or to, hope for the best or, you know, whatever, whatever, however you phrase it. But, you know, we took pride in doing things, um, not ever thinking that we ha would ever pay a steep price with having a mistake, you know, and it happened. Um, and, you know, we, nobody's immune to that momentary lapse that has really tragic results. Nobody. Um, so we just have to be, you know, it's like being super mindful. Like I get in the car and, you know, people, people at the work were like, you, you climb. And I was like, you drive. Cause I think driving is so much more dangerous. And it is. I go, yes. And <laughs> I is. get in the car and get my seatbelt and I just, hope this is, you know, going to be a good drive because there are too many variables out of my control. Well, it's a little bit like that with 
climbing. You, you have a lot of elements of control and then there are certain things that are not always in your control. And if you want, yeah, you have just to be mindful of that. Um, but it was, it was definitely, um, the most intense and the most difficult years year of our life together um and separately i mean oh, oh, each for our own issues i mean he had physical and and brain injury uh recovery issues i had my emotional turmoil um but um you know we made it through the first year but i have to be honest if i could you know go back to that moment seconds prior to that rope slipping through the belay device i would be very happy to rewind to that moment and um have the rope in my hand but that's just something that cannot be rewound so we deal with that so that's my story and you know i also want to say that there's always three sides to the story it was like a coin right there's what he said what she said what really happened so this is my side of the story this is my experience of this event um i'm sure he would have a completely different way of looking at things because he doesn't remember anything he doesn't remember anything of that accident he lost consciousness and basically started remembering like a little bit what was going on when he when we got home so he remembers i think from the day we got home or something like that so at least he was spared with um that part Miriam, do you have you forgiven yourself um that's a good question not a hundred percent um i'm not a perfectionist but i definitely thrive on doing my best and at, with that in mind um have a hard time accepting that that happened for sure is a stupid have you forgiven him um yes i didn't have a big resentment i was just it was not like i didn't actually i did not blame him i felt um misguided in my trust you know like i trusted that everything was fine and it wasn't so that part um was we did a few years of therapy after that and we worked on those um things together but it was not enough to keep the glue together because what kept you know what kept us together was doing fun things together but then those things were not fun anymore are you climbing now you still climb yeah i still climb um I'm not the climber I used to be because I had uh, a couple of injuries in my early 50s and, and consequent surgeries, uh, knee, shoulder. And I was just like, you know, I like to do a lot of different things. I don't want climbing to be the, the it's easy to get injured in climbing only because, you know, you put, you know, you push yourself and you pop a tendon or you, you know, you break a, um, you know, um, yeah, I had I had a, a torn meniscus. I mean, it's very easy to get these like very simple surgery. I mean, uh, injuries. But I like to trail run, and I have two dogs. I like to take them out, and I like to hike. And I just came back from a two week trek in the Alps uh, with with my climbing buddy, friend, girlfriend, and we um, actually uh, thanks to you. I mean, she hooked me up on your podcast, just so you know. And then thanks your climbing to buddy did yeah. your hiking buddy yeah. Jen did. And thanks to um, her and recommending that I listen to your podcast, um, I got thinking about the story and felt um, it felt the, the need to kind of share different levels of the implication of, you know, a lapse of momentary lapse of attention. There's lots going on, lots of layers. Um, and uh, by listening to your podcast, I purchased a Rocky Talkie, actually a pair. And that has transformed my climbing experience. I mean, we love it. You know, the, in the gunks, there's all these little ceilings and roofs. And if it's windy, you can't hear each other. And you have to, you know, you have to do the pulling the rope five times you're on and three times you're off kind of thing. And then hope your belayer understands, the, you know, that you did that. 
now we have the Rocky Talkie, which is great. And we went in the Alps for two weeks trekking, and it was just so wonderful. I mean, the range was unbelievable for one and two. Um, battery life was uh, un unmatched. I mean, after a week, it was at 50%. And we had, it had, was on like 10 hours a day. And it was um, also fun because we never had to make plans. We were walking independently, and but staying connected. And every now and then, you know, one of us would say, hey, Jan, how are you doing? So like, oh, I'm fine still going up the hill or she'd say hey you want to stop for lunch at this beautiful place i'm at and catch up with me and i'm like oh, i'm coming so we had we were connected never feeling like even though one of us was ahead or behind never feeling like we were left behind you know it was really great it was really transformative I, i'm never going without my rocky talkie for real that's great that's a great plug <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I love mine too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. So I want to thank you for doing what you do because um, it gives us a voice and it gives a place for people to learn. Um, I've learned so much from your from the stories of others and uh, of things that I hope you know others um, never have to go through again. Of course. Well, I am so grateful that you were here to share your story with the listeners. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much.